Good evening, everyone. We start our lightning talk now. So, before we start, it's an introduction about Hyperdojo, about how excellent and exceptional we are. Uh, welcome, welcome. And uh, I will be asking that question because probably almost everyone will be here, at least judging by your gaily faces. How many hackers out here? Raise the hands. No, no, no. Many, many more. One in four? I can't believe how. Okay, how many blockchain admirers here? Crypto? Yeah, yeah. yeah at least at least four. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, to those who are not members, we are not profit, and but we still accept donations. And uh, uh, it's community of engineers. We started like many, many years ago, at least 10, uh, in a location right up to the corner, where's Boston Dynamic now, and then moved to another location to another, and that's a fourth location here. So we are old and reputable. Current members, then course volunteers we got a lot of activities here if you can help with anything including money please welcome be welcome donations I already told everyone and everybody that donations are important to gather chips and to survive uh, events mm, a lot of them and by the way tomorrow we're gonna be pitching night two minutes Starts at six. Uh, startups will be able to present to a couple of people, including myself. And the idea is to communicate to, into two minutes your idea to VC or to Angel you met on the street or anywhere else. And there are other events here. Here's the links. You can make a snapshot of that or just go to the hackerdojo.com and see it for yourself. Okay. Hope no question. If any, please ask. If not, we're gonna get immediately to uh, the talks and for the rules. The rules is to be nice and to give uh, smiles and uh, you know handshakes and everything. Hot box. Hot box. Yes. There is a hot box there, right? After the light. After the light, are going to be hot box. And we playing poker today. Anyone joining the country for poker? Well, start with uh, Jim Board, Balaji, 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 friend of mine. Where are you? Yeah, Balaji. Yes, here you are. Mic is yours. And then you can use. Uh... And then you can Maybe use... someone else wanna join the list because there is only five. Usually, that is ten. Six now. Oh, oh yeah, we got six now. Yes. There is still time, plenty of time. James, you wanna join? Yeah, go, go. Okay. We about to go to the platform. Or you ready? Maybe you can stick to uh straight, straight, straight. Yes. The winner, number one. That's yours. This one's mine. This is mine. Yeah, okay. Um, now I always have to plug a thing in. And then try to make the machine happy. <laughs> Finally. Um, so I'm talking about the uh, IBM Type 513 reproduction, reproducing punch tonight. Here's a picture of one. Uh, Wikipedia says it was uh, released around 1933, and the 514 is pretty similar. The same manual covers both of them. It uh, was released in uh, 1949 and withdrawn in uh, 1978. 
And at the Computer History Museum, why won't, no, oh, control page down. There we go. Uh, that's a 519. That one looks a lot more modern than ours. Uh, here we go, the 513. It's got these really neat Art Deco curves on it. What's the purpose of a reproducing punch? Uh, so you have a stack of punch cards and you want to create a duplicate of that stack of punch cards because you're going to go merge these with other punch cards or punch more holes in them or use them for something else. Well, you need a reproducing punch because it'll do it a whole lot faster than if you uh, try to include it in, in some other ways. And I'm interested in helping restore this machine. There actually was a guy named Bob who did a whole lot of work on it uh, five or seven years ago or something like that, but it hasn't been used in about five years. And fortunately on Flickr, I found uh, notes that he made. Uh, you know what goes in there? Those, those are the chips, the, yeah, the little holes, the little holes that are punched. They're chips, not chads, according to, uh, according to the caption on this photo. There's uh, some stuff, and there's some more stuff. And here he took some stuff out of it, and he's doing stuff with it. And he's got to stick that back in eventually, somehow. And I need to get to where I recognize every little piece of this machinery if I'm going to turn it back on. I need to, uh, you know, validate that everything looks like it's in order first. And there's the screws, and I think those are the actual punches right there, because reader brushes are a lot tighter. They don't need so many rows as, as punches do. But I'm not sure, don't quote me on it. And uh, there's another deck of cards here. Uh, control page down. Where uh, he goes through and he sticks his little oil gun into things. But now he's gonna pull something out. See, he's pulling it out. And where he pulled it out of, he's going to do something. And he's doing things. There he is. He's found a hole to stick the oil into. And, uh, is this 1933? Uh, this is a 1933-ish machine, if, if Wikipedia is right. I didn't know it was from the 30s. I knew um, it was used in the 50s. So it has like wires that go through the punch cards so that like sets the presence of the hole? How does it work? It has wires going everywhere. <laughs> I mean, so you put a punch card in. Oh, yeah. It's probably not optical. <laughs> no, it's not optical. It has reading brushes that it goes under. Wow. And there's actually two sets of reading brushes, usually. I think this one has two sets of reading brushes. And then it's going to punch more holes in it. Right. And uh, it operates on a, a negative 48 volt system, like a lot of industrial equipment does, because almost never does 48 volts kill someone. And uh, there's whole lots of stuff where you need 80 wires to go to 80 things, or um, just huge bundles of, of wires. This is uh, going to some cams. They're gonna give the timing to everything else. Uh, this is where the cards go in that you're gonna read. This is where the cards go in that you're gonna punch. The reading is in the first part here and the punching is in the back part there. See, I know one little thing about it already. Anyway, and uh, there's some chips. So, uh, Computer History Museum is a wonderful place. Uh, this is a part of the IBM 1401 uh, demonstration area where they have two 1401 machines. 1401s were announced in 1959, released in 1960 and 1961 and are kind of like the last big thing before the System 360 came out in around uh, 1964. And it really is a, a bridge between the punch card era, which they call uh, unit records. Like it was one record per card before you get into the more electronic machines. And in the 1401, everything acts like a, a punched card, even the memory and the... Thank you for your patronage. <laughs> you are quite welcome. I'm just, I'm just wondering, it's kind of a, you know, you, you may not know the answer to this question, but is there anyone still using those anywhere, maybe? Is anyone still using punch cards anywhere? Uh, I don't know. 
The, the last 602A was decommissioned in Atlanta in 1996, I heard. So if you had asked this maybe 30, 30 years, ago. years ago, the answer would probably be yes, somewhere. Um, fascinating things happen with these machines. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one extra story. Uh, you find people trying to use a calculating punch, which was designed for maybe doing payroll, or maybe multiplying by a multiplier to calculate tax and stuff like that. They use it to invert a 25 by 25 matrix. It takes an entire weekend of moving punch cards from one stack to another. But if it's the only machine around and your engineering department doesn't have any computers, why not use it? Wow. Yes, wow. Ken? Punch card have, have a print across the top. They always have, I mean, the original always has a print. It's so most of the key punches do interpretation. That's called interpreting when you have the letters across the top. A lot of the punches do not. So this, I'm guessing, does not. If you actually need it again later, there's another machine called an interpreter that prints it on there for you. Okay. But the reason to put it on the key punch is so you can look at the card after you punch it and see if you made an error or not. I was wondering how much leeway you have if you have to replace like some piece of electronics from the 1970s, like, and it no longer exists, like, but there's some company that will reproduce it, will they allow you to give you the budget to do that? This, this is a problem, and uh, sometimes people get lucky and they find someone at the old company who still has the designs and they say, hey, on the weekend, we'll try to make you an extra. I know the Apollo guidance computer people found somebody, a, a company that would actually make one of the bizarre connectors that they needed. We hoard parts at the Computer History Museum, you know, like if they see them on eBay or something, we'll, we'll get it if we know that it's relevant. But we end up pluging things and trying to make stuff ourselves. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's just good engineering problems to do that. When I was in college 40 years ago, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mike? When you were in college 40 years ago. Yeah. Okay, all right, when I was in college 40 years ago, right? I got a summer job working for the Army Materials Mechanics Research Center in Watertown, Massachusetts, right? It's not there anymore. But uh, they had a spare Univac, and it had a card reader. Okay. Okay, so I actually used this as my first professional job when I was 19. When I was 19, okay? But never since then, okay? So I don't know about anyone else, but um, my question is, you guys got card readers at the, at the uh, computer museum? Yeah, the, um, the 1402, we've got two of those, which are card readers connected to the 1401. Okay. We've got uh, three, at least three 026 key punches, and I think they've got an 029 key punch there somewhere. Um, and then this machine has a card reader in it, in the reproducing punch. The card, card readers can be obtained, as can punches, because I'm interested in building a simulator for another machine and they pointed out you know if you get it running on a raspberry pi or something in the middle we could put a box around it and have a real key punch and a real uh i mean a yeah card punch and a real card reader and make it look like it's uh doing the real thing uh, my first year of high school we had the next leap of technology after card punches we had paper tape Oh yeah, okay. Which paper eight, tape. Eight, eight, bits, eight holes in the paper. Yeah, eight and then, channel. And then, as long as you wanted the paper to go. Yeah, yeah. So this this story's in, in Silicon Valley about uh, the old homebrew computer club, and this guy named Bill Gates shows up at one of the meetings, and he gets a copy of the paper tape for Basic on the PDP eleven, and takes it home with him. You know, the same Basic that everyone else was sharing. Uh, first job we had a card punch reader, but the engineers or some of our developers wouldn't use those. They'd write them on a piece of paper. They had a woman who was really good at typing, and typing because you can't make any mistakes. Yeah. But actually, type, type the cards for you. Yeah, and, and, the, and the programmers actually had to do it on paper, and they had specific little boxes that you could put one letter or one symbol in, and the key puncher people were going to punch exactly what you. Exactly what you put there. Yeah, that's how programming was done. They're a real skilled type, of, very skilled type of thing. Yeah, and your and your printout would come later in the day, and you could see if your program worked. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I, I used one of these in high school, right? In high school, we had a, a 
a key punch machine, and we punch out cards and send down to the University of New Hampshire to run, and it'd take a week to get the results. You had a key punch machine in high school, you're saying, yeah, that you would punch things in, punch and you'd send it off to the university, and they would run it through their big computer, yeah. and you'd get your results a week later. Yeah. Hey, yeah. whatever, you, you know, back in that era, whatever you could find yeah. for a computer you could no, play with, that was great. Program. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, this is a winner. That's so amazing. Travel to the past. Now, Balaji, are you ready? Yes. You are. And I remember as of these Spanish talks come the year of, uh, as you said, this big sheet of papers is uh, wholesome. And then it was this magnetic uh, tapes, I think, right? Yeah. And it took probably another 20 years <laughs> for us to come that. And then it was the beautiful language of I was taught. Yes, Salaji, your. Uh, um, Hi, uh, I'm Balaji, I'm a software consultant. I'm presenting about uh, <coughs> spider-inspired uh, gym bot, similar to the cockroach-inspired uh, uh, scrum bot, something like that. Uh, <laughs> <is> that? <laughs> nice. uh, so this is um, kind of um, AR, VR uh, enabled uh, a gym bot. I'm going to gym these days. I just remember just uh, how to use uh, different machines in uh, one um, uh, robot, which can uh, uh, help in uh, combining all these uh, eight uh, essential core gym uh, activities to one. So it has push up and uh, all the uh, like uh, uh, all time meters or everything, uh, one um, bot which helps in fit like a physiotherapy, which can uh, help each part customize uh, we are using uh, the machine. So we, it is integrated with the AR VR and uh, which guides as a coach, uh, gym coach, and uh, help a personal customize. Um, gym experience and um, similar to that same mission can be converted into a maybe a mechanic bot so if you take the spider actually they found uh, uh, recently a million year old uh, huge spider uh, in a rock it, it is based on that model basically it has a kind of this type of uh, big head and uh, eight limbs. Of course, uh, spider is eight limbs. And uh, so it has a different mechanics uh, tools which can be integrated for each arm. So the same uh, model can be used in a gym in an eight model uh, exercise. So we just replace the arms. And <coughs> it has a touch screen which can uh, help in customizing. And there is a holder for different tools in the side uh, as a package. So it is a versatile uh, in customizing different tools for the mechanics, like in the car shed or um, uh, any uh, mechanic shop. Uh, it has a cutting player and driller and uh, <coughs> other tools. So similarly, we can go for maintenance. So if you have a Maintenance guy very expensive, so if we are in the apartment buildings, they can hire own a robot which can go and do all this stuff. And uh, similarly, it can be a firefighter just to replace this nozzle, and it can take uh, replace the director, movie director, so it can take a. Uh, eight type of uh, different uh, depth of uh, movie in a, it's a kind of drone which can fly and take the movie. So that is also possible with this uh, bot. 
And um, it's not moving. Yeah, it's good. So another one is for recycling. So it is also based on the spider's uh, thing. <coughs> so it is uh, processing plastic and paper, basically um, two type of head. It's a monster head, but uh, it can feed on uh, different uh, um, recycling materials and it can process in this body and uh, create pellets of plastics and uh, paper strips. And for recycling, it can compactly pack it for ready. So the things is spider-based one, just a uh, lighter. Uh, other things are just a uh, eye candy. It's a truck based on the spiders, the head part. In uh, also the it can be used as a maintenance truck with all the limbs. Um, so they almost come to close. Uh, so let's have a Halloween craft to using the spider. That's all. Uh, thank you. Excellent. So if you want to combine your garbage collection with a horror movie experience, give your tag. Okay, questions. So uh, what point of uh, development is this? Is this just concept or yeah, it is uh, just a concept uh, have, but can be developed. Some uh, some have developed Jimbot, I think, but not this type one. There are some machines available um, for physiotherapy they use, particularly for a certain leg and uh, hand movement. So it is not for gym, but physiotherapy they use. Yes. Yeah, just, just to respond to that a second, uh, some gyms do have uh, machines that you get a, an identifying bracelet and it moves the machine to your particular setup. That's happening at the uh, the YMCA down in South Valley here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. I have. Uh, I didn't know. So it's mm -hmm. a good point. Uh, so it is kind of AR VR enabled. So the, there is a guidance from uh, like a personal coach. Yeah. Thank you. I actually had the same idea a few weeks ago. But I, I, have you looked into if there's like any training data already available on, I wonder, like body movement to actually make this feasible or, yeah. Uh, data related to this, um, how the physical um, experience, I mean, uh, what is the actual data you are looking for? Well, if you're going to make like a, a gym bot, you're going to have to, you know, train the model. Physio, okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, there is a virtual thing we can use. We don't need a actual person. The resistance and the heat map, those can be simulated. Uh, but uh, if you want a person who can volunteer, that is good, yeah. Uh, most uh, mammals have four legs. Uh, Animals like spiders with eight legs, are they more stable when they're walking? Can they, are they better at going over uneven terrain than just having four legs? Is that the reason they have eight legs? And would there be a possibility to have a vehicle, a car-sized vehicle, but with eight legs based on the spider? Eight legs, okay. Interesting. Uh, I've seen in the movie now, there's a Spider-Man movie, there, there is a villain which has uh, uh, hands, I mean, kind of uh, eight uh, similar, uh, yeah, it is possible to attach as a limb to the car, but it will be a uh, hindrance for traveling. I'm, I'm not sure how it will be. The Mars rovers have, have eight wheels. They have eight wheels, yeah. Oh, eight wheels, you are sorry, talking well, about. I was talking about eight legs. Legs, like okay. A, a, a mammal, but with eight legs. So the question is whether having eight legs provides some kind of advantage compared to four to the maintenance robot or as a device, as I understood it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, it is uh, not showing the eight limbs, but it is enabled uh, with uh, eight type of machineries. It's kind of uh, in, it built inside. So you can see in the side there is some protuberance and uh, so that is representing the limbs, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. Uh, next is uh, Utopia. Right. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I might be up there. Uh, go there, and you can connect your computer. Yes, just stay on the stage. Uh, so last week, um, I was able to use that mic because oh, yeah. this Please. thing was not. Of course. Yeah, thanks. And that one you can take off back off the stand. All right. Uh, oh, people, I thought we need to get that mic back because we need to record uh, the questions. And with this mic... Yeah, you can take it off the stand. Yeah, you uh, can do this. Oh, okay. You okay. can do that. And walk freely around. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding spiders, probably they got me because they crawl vertical surfaces and then kind of, you know, hand and cross, they're making the <laughs> amazing structures. And they probably need more wings. However, that's a good question. I don't really know why it's eight, not say like 12, but maybe six. Anyone have an answer for that? Okay, now we got a presentation. All right, so I'm following up my talk last week about, <laughs> oh my goodness, it, it was mainly about eternal youth. Um, but if you look at my YouTube channel, that's just Moonshot 1. I have these other uh, two Moonshots, and when we're dreaming, why not? Why not? shoot for everything. <laughs> uh, Moonshot 2 is Spaceships for Everyone. I have to write that because there's a thousand character limit for, on YouTube. And Moonshot 3 is Necromancy or Resurrection, uh, which is very, very actually, you know, growing up in the West, how can you deny Judaism, Islam, Christianity? You know, that's, that's like saying, that, I mean, that's the big elephant in the room, especially in modern times, I think. So, what I want to uh, focus this week's talk on is just utopia, because dreaming about this stuff is dreaming about utopia, right? We'll have, everyone can live forever, we will all have our spaceships, just like that TV series, what was it, uh, Firefly, and uh, that movie Serenity, which they put up on the International Space Station, because it was just so cool. You see all these people in their little spaceship, and they have to share rooms in the spaceship, just like you know we kind of share rooms in houses and big apartment buildings. We, all, we share that big apartment building, and it was so cool, these guys were, on this little spaceship, Serenity, just a couple rooms, and there was such a warmth of humanity, and uh, it, was a, it was a kind of utopia, a small little utopia. Um, so, um, so I, I briefly touched on Moonshot 3 uh, uh, last week, and then someone from the audience came up and told me about how Caligula haunted Rome uh, after he died, and haunted Rome until his sister gave Caligula a proper burial. So, um, this person also told me how Al Capone was such a bad person and he killed people, and one of the people he killed came back to haunt him. Um, I, I, uh, as this the week progressed from last Friday till now. I talked about this with, with someone else in a public setting, and um, that person was like, this is just psychological. But I was saying, okay, it's very easy to evade science. But you evade nature, the journal, you evade all these peer-reviewed things. But there's so much local legend about hauntings, and this is probably the tip of the iceberg. How do we bring these souls back to life. So I think there's something there. You know, you Golden Gate Park in San Francisco is supposedly haunted by 
by a police officer who, who pulls people over, um, but the ticket number doesn't trace back to anything. So uh, that, that's just another local legend I heard, but there are so many of these local legends and there's no way to, there's like nature does not try to investigate any of this. Um, but anyway, focusing this week on utopia, I. I had an idea, I think it is my original idea. I can't remember hearing this from someone else. Um, so, I have started saying in, in recent months to people, a small town in the West has the same amount of time in a single day, uh, a small town, 30,000 people, they have the same amount of time in a single day that a, one person has an entire lifetime. So basically it's another way of saying we live about 30,000 days. And that's not a, a lot of time. I see I have 52 seconds left, so I better wrap this up. So, uh, so with, within 52 seconds of time, I put these calculations up here. Basically in a single day, there's about a million years of time spread throughout US population. In a single day, there's 22 million years of time spread across the entire planet. This is why we can build skyscrapers, we can, we have all these mega cities. I think I have so little time, I have 20 seconds left. And just think about it more, it's just like, there's so much time, there's like 22 million years spread across all civilization. And at the margin, yeah, some people are babies, they can't do much, some people are very old, but that's, that's still, I mean, you would say that there's, it's not 22 million, maybe there's 20 million. You cut down 10%, it's like, there's so much time. Thank you for your patronage. All right, all right, okay, I'm out of time. Uh, I, like, uh, I think many questions, right? So, you first, or oh, Jay, yes. Okay. I'm just gonna ask about, oh. I'm just going to ask, um, under the email discord uh, on your uh, thing here, it says YouTube channel. Uh, let me read this here. Maynard Hayate UK Wannabe. <laughs> yes, that, that is my YouTube channel. Oh, wow. um, let, me, let me zoom out a little bit. Yeah, this, this is one. my, yeah, so, okay. Uh, you want to you wanna take the time with me to explain this? Um, UK Wannabe is not the Spice Girls song, it's, it's not United Kingdom Wannabe, it's, uh, it's Uruhara Kisuke Wannabe. I, I have this thing where Uruhara Kisuke is this anime character in this anime bleach, and he wears this really green and white hat. I, I bought two of these on Amazon. And it's very, very interesting uh, because I think there's something so special about the United Kingdom, actually. And this kind of breeds jealousy among the rest of Europe when I say this. But uh, the United Kingdom comes out with the Magna Carta, no more king, royal families, you know, there's always a little weak link in royal families and the whole country goes to hell because of it. This is the same with China. This is very similar in, in a lot of Europe. Uh, so Magna Carta, now we have a much more better system of government that's resistant to just little weak links and families. Um, the Industrial Revolution, that, you know, this came out of UK again. Uh, this, and I think there is this fourth dimensional green and white dragon that is kind of blessing all this civilization changing, uh, you know, getting closer to utopia stuff, that these two things are probably the most... Uh, we have more questions here. Uh, getting to utopia. All right, uh, yeah. Would you say that your um, channel focuses more in utopia or human longevity or like a combination of both or utopia in the framework of longe the longevity because I could foresee problems with the population that doesn't age in 
do we allow them to have children that don't age and resources and yeah right so this is um i in, in last week i said there's eternal youth but i every time i bring this up i say there's a huge dread lord ball of evil all surrounding eternal youth i've, I've been told rich people are going to continue their corporations and their organizations of power they will not have this humility thinking they will actually die and they have to meet their maker and you know come honest to god um so uh to answer your question uh i am really tangible focused a lot of times and so i've been uh, watching this Stanford free lectures and really going through this um, and I highly recommend it um, this is an introduction to bioengineering and so I, I'm very focused on this first moonshot because I realized the second and third moonshot there you know why not dream big uh, <coughs> but this first one is most tangible Thank you, Guy. Economics of Immortality. Next speaker, Jason. TV. You're welcome. Uh, well, we have such a deep subject sometimes that it's easily, definitely not enough five minutes plus in another time to cover it. But we're trying. Uh, Just going to set up my uh, yes, video. Yes, do it. Uh, some application tracking ghosts probably going to be helpful. Something like that. Okay, Jason, that's your. Oh, yeah, get the sound off. It is the sound. Show is yours. So I don't have the sound set up yet, but I mean, uh, for the demo. So this is my demo, my startup uh, TV feeder. I'm the founder, Jason Gilbert. So this is the uh, new mobile smart TV system. So you can connect anything you want, streaming services, TV, video games, websites. So I've been developing this for a long time. And I'm thankful for Hacker Dojo. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, Kind of developing some friends. I'm new to uh, the Bay Area. I'm from Min Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, it's exciting that finally my software is working. And I'm working on getting a graphic designer to polish up some of these icons here uh, and uh, make a better video. And I'm actually progressing towards hopefully getting like co-founders and initial angel investors. So what I have to do this week now is get my cap table set up to figure out like what percentages each person gets. Uh, we have to reserve uh, uh, percentages for future employees. Uh, we're gonna have to hire uh, you know, marketing. That's what I need people to help me with marketing. I do social media. So you can find it on uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I have a YouTube channel, um, Discord, um, WhatsApp. Sorry, there's a problem here. Don't hack my computer. So basically, uh, yeah, this is kind of the future of the internet. So let me read a little uh, speech from this that I'm uh, that I'm preparing. So a TV feeder is a new mobile operating system for phones, computers, tablets, TVs, and virtual reality. So this could be really exciting in virtual reality. You can watch all the windows. It's, it's not just videos. It's, it's really uh, any window. So any one of these windows can be anything. It can be a remote desktop. It can be email. It can be website tabs. So it could be like a new browser tab. You can flip through just like TV channels. You can flip through everything. So it connects all streaming services, websites, applications, and video games together on all platforms. So it doesn't matter what type of device you have. You can have uh, as small as a watch to as big as a big screen projector to a virtual reality, computers, phones, TVs, tablets, and uh, it works with no hardware, no software, uh, it's all software, so no hardware, no wires required, that's all in the internet. 
I'm using, uh, I want to do like a, in the future to be all decentralized internet where right now we have with the data centers, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Google, they own all the data centers. So that's where the blockchain comes in, where we can have decentralized GPUs, each person owns their own server, AI, streaming to our, all of our other friends, servers and AIs and GPUs. So there's really going to be a massive increase in the GPUs. And basically what that leads to is, uh, so let me go on with my speech here. Uh, users gain productivity by saving favorites lists and scheduling appointments for switching the windows. So you can schedule what these windows are. So you want your email to come on channel two at two o'clock, you want YouTube to come on channel five at three o'clock, you need your video conference to come on at two o'clock on channel 10. It all happens automatically, so you don't have to worry about programming and switching everything and like pulling up all your websites on time. Also, advertisers can increase their prices because many more and local businesses can use TV Feeder to address a larger and targeted audience. So right now, advertising is the most powerful industry in the world, besides for the oil industry, and I think I can increase the amount of advertising by, instead of having these large corporations control the advertising, we can have, so here it's repeating now, but uh, we can have the local businesses put their advertisements, and you can, content creators can sell their own advertisements to their fans. So, you can actually have all your friends watch your advertisement and make money from your friends and build a local community that way through the advertising. So, I'm raising my angel funding of 200000 for the 2023 go-to-market. Now, unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be available in 2023 because uh, I've been doing this for four months now and uh, I haven't really made much progress since I released this video in June. But I do have a very large growing network of the inventor of live streaming and virtual reality, business and telecommunications, broadcasting, audio, video, consumer electronics, computer graphics, displays, AR, VR, XR, media production, networking and data center infrastructure, wireless and mobile connectivity, chip and storage hardware, software as a service, crypto, blockchain, Web3, Smart cities, autonomous vehicles, AI, and renewable energy. And I'd like to go into that further, but I guess that's the end of my time. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so these feeds, would these be pulled from existing providers, like, say, YouTube or Netflix? And I, I'm just curious, like, what would be hosting all these feeds? Um, also, this kind of reminds me of uh, Back to the Future 2, when his son was watching, like, the eight channels at once. It really had that vibe. So. Yeah, that's, that's one of the comments people get, is that it's exactly possible to do this, what they do in Back to the Future. You basically can switch all the windows around, you can select what you want. I'm working on it. Uh, the voice commands to be able to just say channel 5, YouTube, and it'll turn on, like just like that. So with, with voice commands now, that's that's easily possible with my software. And as far as what, how the back end works, it depends on what each one of these windows is. If it's a video com communication between you and me, if it's a broadcast to millions of people, if it's a remote desktop, if it's a video game, uh, etc. Those are all different back end scenarios. And I don't have a lot of that figured out yet. Uh, I'm, I'm I want it to be all decentralized on the blockchain and peer to peer through decentralized GPUs. Um, but right now, this works fine with like current Web2 infrastructure with uh, streaming. Each one of these can be an individual stream or they can be all aggregated as one stream also. All right, Jason. Uh, my question is obviously in, in regards to blockchain. Um, have you looked further into that and what you're actually going to do? Because when you say decentralized decentralization, there's many variations of decentralization. Are we decentralizing the content? Are we decentralizing the, the data service? Am I going to stake my my GPU or am I going to host my own node and, and run this data on my on my uh, hard drive? Like, have you looked? more into what you're doing there? 
Yeah. Uh, so the way the decentralized part works is I actually envision even uh, with the autonomous vehicles that the self-driving cars will have cameras and video streaming to each other and that would, the cars will be communicating and the cars themselves will be nodes in the internet, exchange points. So each one of us will be an internet exchange point with our own node and server and GPU and AI exchange point to streaming to other people's nodes, servers and GPUs and AI. So as far as the Web3 aspect, I don't think we've even come close to developing that out yet where there's just a massive increase in the GPUs and the decentralized server edge nodes. Uh, okay, I want to ask you some questions about, you mentioned you're setting up a corporate entity, and I wondered, uh, did somebody advise you to do that uh, at this point in the journey, or, or did you decide that on yourself, or what, are, what the thinking is behind that? Because I have a reason for it, I'll explain in a second. Maybe you could just explain a little bit. Sure. Um, it, well, one thing, I don't think you want to pay for that yourself, okay? Another thing, too, is before you really have a, a business customers, investors, the way you set it up is going to be hard to know. You know, it's going to be like you're trying to predict the future. Um, if I, I would advise you just to hold off on that until you had investors or customers or, or both. Because there's really no hurry to do it now because it's so easy to do it the wrong way that they'll have to do it over again anyways. Just to give you some advice. Well, I already have it registered as a Delaware corporation. So. Yeah, yeah, that's not going to hurt anything, but um, because you know. the, and the re somebody was asking me why I do it in Delaware, and the reason you do that is because well, yeah, everyone knows that you have to go to Delaware for that. But I'm just saying, no, I, I, so, I don't think you should have done it yet, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I, I did that many, many years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, Are you still paying the taxes on that? Yeah, yeah. So I've been paying. I've been paying the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that's why. Very good for the society in general, don't you understand? <laughs> okay, more questions. Next, uh, Romy, who is the first story about studying... TV feeder, yeah, thank you. ...legal things. How many lawyers do you have in the room? <laughs> Former lawyers. Former lawyers? Yeah, you know what? Thank you. Know yeah. How do I, uh, yeah, yeah, I've been working in tech for the past, uh, what is it, like 15 or 20 years, um, and I, like, I haven't, all my friends in college became lawyers, because I went to school in New York, so that's just what people did, oh, there's no signal, so um, I went to the Stanford Law Hackathon, and everyone on my team was way smarter than me, oh wait, so, okay, so, which was cool, okay, so, which was cool, I didn't mind that, um, it's just like, they were always, uh, smarter than me, and um, I, it was kind of cool. They taught me how to set up uh, like local GPT with a Llama model, like Llama 2 um, from uh, Facebook, and that was just very cool because it's just like a lot of information. I just can't uh, study every single thing. I'm an engineer normally, but there's just so much stuff coming out. And all the research scientists I know, like I used to work at Bell Labs, that was like the code monkey there. But even the ones in AI that work at Google or Facebook or Apple like that I've met, it seems like even they can't keep up with it. So if they can't keep up with it, how can I keep up with it? They're even writing scripts to summarize all the new papers. Like they said they can't even like read it like normal people used to. Like in the old days, I was at Bell Labs for a while as a code monkey and like I tried to follow along their white papers and it seemed like it went at a human pace. But now everyone's just like using uh, generative AI even there, just to summarize the new stuff coming out. So I was just like, okay, um, anyway, it's a long story. But um, one, one interest I have is constitutional law, because all my friends were lawyers at these law schools, and they talked about it, and it was like a big deal. And my friends that became politicians, they were really into it, and I just never got around to studying it, because it's kind of long and boring. Like, if you see constitutional, constitutional documents, they're just like very long and tedious. So. Um, I decided to uh, to use this local GPT. It's like um, and just uh, feed a bunch of PDFs because that's what local GPT is really good for. Like if you go to OpenAI, um, I don't think you can upload PDFs yet, can you? Like oh, you can. Okay, I just didn't know. <laughs> but this is but this is local. You don't have to go online. So this and this is used as Llama 2, which everyone says is almost as good as OpenAI. I'm not really sure. 
So I just went through and I was like, okay, I, I've been hanging out in South America. I just never, I only went to Brazil 20 years ago, but I went to Argentina. I was like, um, and then I went on a little tour and they showed me the constitution. I was like, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. I know, I don't know where to start. I'm kind of too busy to, to read constitutional law. It's just very boring. And all the, all the, I could do the courses. I hate online courses. I hate video courses. I'm one of those people that likes print books. I was just like, okay, maybe I can um, learn generative AI uh, loophole-like stuff, like problems and advantages, and use that to study constitutional law. So I just started, I did an innocent feeding of like the um, constitutions of Brazil. Um, I think uh, this one was Chile. I think that's one of the more modern ones. But then I did read another report that the Latin American countries, they kind of trash their constitutions and create new ones. Um, I forgot what the name was. And that's actually a theory that a lot of people, constitutional scholars support in the US because they say ours is one of the oldest and it's kind of too outdated. But that's another topic we could probably have. So I just put all of them in, and I was naive. I didn't know anything about uh, case law, because you don't, you can't just like feed the raw constitutions in. So that was one thing um, I learned taking it to Sudaroom, another hacker space in Oakland. Just I was like talking to people who were they spent all day doing this stuff as research scientists, and then somehow they knew this. Like someone knew this, and they were like, "Oh, you can't just feed the constitutions and and learn about this." Like there's also case law, and I was like, "Oh God, I'm so dumb." Like. <laughs> That's, that's why they're always like doing the Brown versus Board of I mean, I know this, it's just like I work in tech. I don't really have to think about this except when tech companies get sued for, I don't know, monopolies and stuff. That's when I really pay attention to this stuff or when um, they do like weird stuff with uh, reproduction rights in states where people want to put a tech office and then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I was just like, okay, and then I can learn about the differences. And then um, it was a very cool learning journey. It was just like really fun to uh, feed all this information um, I, I like, uh, I like, there's actually organizations that do comparative constitutional law. So I'd be like um, asking these naive questions like, um, is the Uruguayan constitution similar to US, more similar to US constitution or Brazil and Argentina? And part of this exercise was learning which questions to ask because some of my questions were pretty stupid. But um, I, did, I did learn quite a, like a bit about both generative AI and constitutions. And then um, it led me to learn about the histories. Um, as you all know, you can't just take for granted what uh, the generative AI says, like there's hallucinations, there's like weird uh, misinformation and misquotes. Also, um, unless, I know there's a way you can do version control in Hugging Face, but I don't think there's a version control as far as I know. So you, like all the answers can be totally different and totally wrong. Like you can ask the same uh, model that you fit all the data in, it'll, it'll just be totally different. And, um, or sometimes I'll go to like uh, very specific sources. So uh, it was just a very fun for me, uh, like I, wait. Oh, this is like uh, the photo. Um, so, ah, okay. And then um, I, it was cool. I just like, uh, I was drawing like this uh, gaucho. It's like a cowboy over there. It's just like totally random here. Well, I had to wait. It's like um, everything ran in my machine. So I kind of learned um, how the other engineers, they put everything on these uh, served A A100s and that only took like two seconds when they did it, but with me it took forever. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, but uh, basically, um, I w I'm able to, I was doing various questions like uh, what, like how, how do the constitutions differ with regards to gun rights, human rights, and I got a lot of answers and that was just really fun. It was like a fun learning journey. I think this would be cool for the classroom. You could teach people how to trust the generative AI. You can introduce people in tech who never want to study law or get bored, studying law in a traditional course um, to actually like pay attention to it because they can ask targeted questions. Um, and then you could also see the disadvantages and advantages of these tools. Because we, we obviously know they, they have their pluses and minuses. And we could also spot how they might hinder or hurt our learning. Like uh, maybe it is better to read a print book about the Constitution, the way it's better to write notes by hand on paper than it is to, uh, to learn online with videos. So, um, no, that's it. Okay. Thank you for your patronage. <laughs> Oh, and, uh, yeah. there are questions okay. in numbers. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting. I like your study very much. Um, the G in GPT is for generative. So if it's looked at all these constitutions and it um, has seen it's, each one has the pluses and minuses, like you say, have you asked it to generate a better constitution, the perfect or Oh wow, that would be really constitution. interesting. Yeah. What's interesting is I started feeding it uh, additional papers, so I put in Jacobin's this left-wing magazine, 
And they're like, oh, towards a more Marxist uh, interpretation. And um, Marxism is actually very popular with a lot of uh, capitalists here, which I was surprised by, because we're, we're reaching like peak capitalism and automation. So I did that, and then, yeah, I didn't go in that direction, but that would be kind of cool. Like, it'd be cool to say, um, what is a more Marxist, or what is a more libertarian? Oh, sorry. Oh, go on. Yeah, and I was feeding it, like, papers from constitutional scholars, So I, I, but it's like, I just don't know what's good or bad or what, um, but it'd be kind of cool to just keep feeding it more information. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be a cool project, right? And I don't, I don't think it'd be like the perfect answer to like, oh, what will be, but it might be like really interesting to see what it comes up with, yeah, so. Hey, yeah, cool presentation. Just yeah. curious about your implementation on, like, how did you process, parse the PDF documents, like your implementation? Like, um, I, I just like dumped them as PDFs into the source folder of a local GPT, and, it, and then I just had it ingest it following the local GPT. <laughs> and I know you can fine tune it, and this scientist at Pseudoroom, he's like, okay, you can do this. There's all these like little things you can fine set, but I just use a default implementation. But I don't know all the settings by off the top of my head. He was like, oh yeah, that's a standard. Um, so it's like you just take, it's like a, wait, maybe I'll put it here. And we were, we were doing this at my hackathon, uh, but, uh, ah, where's my mouse? So I just like dumped it in the, like you're supposed to just dump it and uh, it's kind of funny, um, the source document, it has this random AI paper in here, which I don't know if that's a good idea. There's like an ORCA paper in here. But it, uh, I mean, uh, the llama has, like there's just like a, oh, ah, help. Okay, sorry. But this, it's basically, this has a random uh, paper and I just like put these, I uh, put these articles, I put the constitution stuff, I put uh, scholarly constitution work or random crackpot articles about constitutions from newspapers. <laughs> so I don't really understand how to weight it yet, but it's kind of cool. They have all these settings, and as a beginner, it's kind of cool. I could probably tweak it, so. I'd also be curious to see, these are in English. And yeah, they're all in English, so I wonder, yeah. I'd be curious if it understands Spanish and ask it to compare the translations to the original. Yeah, that'd be really interesting, right? Because, um, yeah, I, I had a, I have a tutor. I was talking to like different uh, language teachers, and one of them said that it works with some dialects in South America. And I was wondering how that worked. And I, and this is all, this would all have to do with the model, right? So I was using Llama two, which is supposed to be really good. I mean, I'm so naive. I just haven't kept up. And it's like they're like, oh yeah, it's really good. And I have a and the guy was like, he, I saw the presentation from one of their engineers uh, the other week, and he was just like, blah blah blah. And it's like I feel really dumb. I just don't know. I know it's very good. So I just don't. <laughs> He was like, yeah, the Transformers, are the, and I was like, um, I just don't know. So I, I don't know if it's better than ChatGPT with the languages, but I was hearing people say that like certain regions, like my teacher was saying it was really good handling Argentinian Spanish. So I, I, it'd be really cool to see if it could handle Mexican constitutional law very well. I don't know, but usually um, the constitutions are written in more formal standardized language. And I know Spanish is very standardized much more than English because they have an academy in Spain that's totally authoritarian. And that's why it's so easy to learn Spanish, because I think they obey their academies better. For the that's what I that's what my friends a professor said. Oh, they don't. He yeah official documents. No, he was saying no, but like that's on the street. But I'm saying he he's a was an Argentinian literature professor, and he's saying the reason why it's a lot easier to learn Spanish no matter where you go is just like there was a standardization process in the 19th century that like never could never happen in English and it's even hard to do it in German. I like the Germans like they changed some rules like 15 years ago. Oh sorry. We it's have too long. Questions? Okay, sorry it's too long. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was like nerdy out. Yeah, try to I'll keep it short. It, yes. Sorry. Okay, uh, have you considered the implications such as a lot of times law in just the way it is written is to maximize like the benefit of like a certain party, like you said, like the Brown first, the Board of Education. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of biases and a lot of like discrimination in law. And are, is humanity prepared to parse through law and say like, oh no, this was clearly like racist. This is a, you know, like or this, or this is biased towards this or that, like, there's a lot of biases I'm not even sure humans know that they have that machines may just uncover and just tell people like, no, what you're doing here is will lead to this. 
Well, I, I don't know, my, my model started going crazy and it started, instead of citing the constitutions directly, it kept going back to this paper on the separations of power crisis in Argentina. And I, I don't have the answer here, but it was like, yeah, the separation of powers in Argentina and Latin America, they, they have been abused. Like it started giving these opinions. Um, Latin American constitutions like all abuse them for the favor of the rich. So it started sounding really leftist all, out of the blue. Um, no, I just, I just was, I thought that was weird. And that just happened today. Uh, it didn't happen like when I was at Suda Room on Tuesday. So it, did, it started getting very opinionated. <laughs> and, it, and it was all, it was all like looking at this one paper, which was just like very critical of a crisis that Argentina had in the 30s. Um, and it's just, but then it started going through all the other Latin American, and they're just like, yeah, like it has only benefited the rich. So it started, it started getting very opinionated. So that, that actually did happen. Um, only the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for your patronage. Oh, should I stop now? Okay. Another question there. Oh, there. Oh, okay. I actually did a similar project. Like oh, a, wow. A, almost like, like almost a year ago, I started with like Azure and cognitive search and durable function and stuff like that. And I did later. I, I used generative AI after that. But did you actually end up? pulling case law into it because that's really difficult. I just, you get, you get I know, it, I was. I did a, I did like a, a uh, yeah, it's like that's part, that part yeah. was like, oh, I mean, I just felt really dumb. They're like, oh yeah, you should do his case law. And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. they'll just have rate limiting under APIs or they'll, they'll ban you even if you're changing your, your IP all the time. It's pretty hard. Oh wait, they'll unless, ban, they'll ban you? Like, uh, yeah, 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 unless it's, I mean, unless it's a publicly available API or you, you request to, to use it. Oh wait, case what do you, law, right? case, case law? law? Oh, those are, yeah, I, I hung out with a law librarian. Those are all like, a lot of those are like controlled by these private companies, right? And they cost a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we, that's what we did our hackathon. Yeah, so. So this is just, you just have the constitutions of the different Latin American countries and you're asking questions. You're not really trying to answer legal questions. Um, I started feeding short summaries of case, the top 25 case law. Okay. Uh, cases in the U.S. because someone pointed that to me when I went to Sudan, which is really great. That's why you go to hackerspace. And I started doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if it's legal to start feeding it because you. I, I hang out with a law library, and I was like, yeah, some of those are you have to pay for it, right? And they're they're these very expensive resources. But you could just do it without telling anyone, right? You could just like no one's going to be like looking your generative AI and being like they, you can't. They, it's a black box, so you could just go in and like have someone scan it and not tell them. And, oh no, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying you should, but it's possible, right? Okay, I'll stop. So. Obviously, we need more okay. of the wrong time for us because we, no, I, you are so popular. We oh, no, no, no. I, but the key thing is to hang out with people who, not just with people hanging out in tech, because that's what I've been doing. It was kind of fun to be on lawyers, and um, they're, they were kind of like depressed, depressed, but they seem happy. <laughs> no, they seem happier working with us. So, And you'll, you'll make a lawyer less depressed if you like enter that's, their lives. So. That's important. Okay. Making okay. it rich and less depressed. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Jackson. Okay, Jim with uh, H2O Shield. Okay. You ready? Almost. Do you want to make a talk? You look at me as you want to make a talk. <coughs> now. Yes, you. And I mean you. <laughs> okay, I, I give you a little uh, context here. Um, now, previously, about two weeks ago, I did a, a lightning talk, and we just we introduced something called non Newtonian fluids. And non-Newtonian fluids demonstrate this phenomenon where you have this uh, viscosity that shows up when you put energy into the fluid. So it showed, we had a picture of a guy hitting this stuff. It's like a goopy stuff. It's a combination of water and cornstarch. And by hitting it, it suddenly appear, it turns hard. Now, that created some controversy in here. And I had some discussions with people afterwards, among them Eric. And, and the question was, does, does the hardness of that come from the water or does it come from the cornstarch? And I ha have this video right here. Um, this is a Mythbuster episode and that's him holding a uh, 50 caliber sniper rifle and they're going to be shooting it into water. And um, I don't know if we're going to get sound here. Let's see what we got. 
6,000 feet per second. I don't know whether you understand what is about to happen here, but this is the M1 Grand. Yeah. This is the 50 caliber. <laughs> the M1 Grand holds 150 grains. This one is 600 grains. This kills you? This kills you and everyone else in the room. Yeah, let's just be prepared to get, unpack and get out of here really fast. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be gone before the pool fully drains. <laughs> Eyes and ears, this is the 50 caliber at 10 feet. Come hell or high water, this beast is going to get fired. Three, two, one. That was more like an explosion than a gunshot. But where's... So, um, let, me, let me ask a question and let me uh, first explain that they, on this show, they... They shot another bullet. This is a, um, a, a 9 millimeter, which is much less energy to it than a 50 caliber. And it went about um, 15 feet in the pool. Now, does anybody have any predictions of what's going to happen to this one? Well, let's, let, let's see some hands. Does it go farther than 15 feet, or does it go shorter? More energy shorter. goes shorter. 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 You guys are all shorter? Yeah. Okay, is anything else going to happen to the bullet, do you think? It explodes. You're right. <laughs> you guys have seen this before or something. Nope? Okay. Bullet. There is no bullet in the ballistics gel. But with this weapon, the bullet could have gone through the gel and buried itself in the far side of the pool. What do you got? I got a bunch of stuff. It expended all its energy within three feet and became totally non lethal. Wow. <laughs> At 20. So, the theme of this show was whether you can use H2O as a shield. Um, my point, though, is that the real, the real source of the structural properties that are in water and that are also in non Newtonian fluid are from the water. They're from the water. And so what you've got to imagine happening here is that as that bullet hit, it set some of its energy out into the water and it caused some of the molecules therein to have their pull, their, to put enough space between them that their polarity was reactivated. Because in water, the polarity is already turned off by the fact that they're surrounding each other. But this put enough space in there that their polarity was activated. And so a good way to think about this is that for maybe a millionth of a second, something appeared in front of that bullet that was similar to a great big bunch of ice. And it was probably even stronger than ice. In fact, it would have to be stronger than ice because if you shoot a 50 caliber into ice, it doesn't do that. So, um, that's, and so my point was, the point I was trying to get across was that Hey, it's the water. The water has the structural capabilities in it. And this is important because my premise is that in the atmosphere, um, tornadic vortices, they are structural entities. They are, they are conduits of the atmosphere. And the only way they could do this is if water does have these properties that under certain highly energetic conditions, they can have structural properties that emerge and that allow this kind of capability to, well, not this kind, but the kind of capability we see in storms. And that's very important for my startup because we're going to be uh, mitigating storms. That's the idea behind it. So um, just wanted to, it, it's funny too, because I got on, after that talk, I got on the internet and I typed in bullets into water, and this is the first one that popped up, and it was just the perfect video because it just, I mean, how can you, and how in the world can you explain how a bullet like that wouldn't travel much farther that has so much more velocity? Well, the only way to explain it is that the water therein actually became very hard for a millionth of a second. Then a millionth of a second later, it went back to being regular water. So um, that's the end of my talk here. Okay, shooting with water, that's 
what we probably going to be doing. Yes. Is there any example of having the gun start underwater? Does the same effect happen? I know we've talked about this might be the surface tension. So I'm wondering if, if you put the gun underwater and then will the bullets shoot? Um, yeah, yeah, you actually can get a gun to shoot underwater. I just know that from, from the fact that I saw some other YouTube videos that were, I didn't really look into that too closely, but you know, there's surface in that too though, because anytime you put um, the gases coming out of the gun, you have a surface between the gases coming out and the, and the water. So in a sense, what this is doing is it's creating three-dimensional surface tension. Um, and we all think of surface tension as being something that's very weak. Actually, for its size, it's, it's very, very strong. And when you can put it into three dimensions, this demonstrates how incredibly strong are the, are the structural capabilities of water when the right situational factors activate them. All right, so my question was, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure this out. So I know that a smaller bullet is going to have less kinetic energy than a bigger bullet, right? So is that what's make, making this impact? Like, because the, the, the bullet is going to be stopped, right? The, 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 and that's what's going to make it just explode, right? So all this kinetic, kinetic um, energy. Well, it's, 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 in, it's important to understand, though, that unless you have higher energy, you're not going to create that much um, I think of it as like a block of ice that appears on the scene for a fraction of a second. And you're not going with to, sm with less energy, you're not going to have a big block of ice, is, is one way to put it. Yeah. Uh, as I remember from our basic course of physics, that m multiplied by v squared divided by 2, right? That's your kinetic energy. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time since I've done this, but I, <laughs> I have a master's in MIT in aeronautical engineering, okay, aerospace. And this is, water is a, a non-compressible fluid, all right, as opposed to air, all right? So we get shock waves in air, all right? And as you approach the speed of sound, you get this shock wave. We all know about this. That's where the sonic boom comes from, right? But I can't remember. This is a non-compressible fluid. And what is the speed of sound in the water? It's pretty high, right? It's, yeah, it's very high. What is it? I don't know off the top of my head. All right. Is this bullet traveling faster than the speed of sound in the water? I don't know. That's a good question. It probably is. All right, all yeah. right. So, I mean, alternative explanation is merely that we have a shock wave in the water, okay, that forms because this bullet is trying to travel faster than the speed of sound in the water. All right? Uh-huh. And therefore, um, this shock wave extends far out into the water. And, and that shock wave then uh, communicates the fact that there are water molecules back to the bullet over a great, you know, over a great surface area. And therefore, that's what stops the bullet. I mean, it's just an alternative explanation. I mean, truth be told, Oh. I, can't, I can't remember exactly all the physics. But let's say, impressed. let's say you were to shoot the same bullet into some other substance. Let's say that's similar to our, let's say, vegetable oil or something like that. Um, do you think it would do the same thing as this? I guarantee it won't, because uh, the oh, thing okay. about vegetable oil, it doesn't have the structural properties hidden inside. H2O does. All right. I think that um, I, I want to see the actual textbook explanation of how non-compressible fluids behave. Now, I am the textbook on this. Okay, all right, all right. I, I'm not joking either. All right, all right. All right. I, so, wish I, I really wish I was joking too. All right. Does the viscosity of the water change under different properties? Like some things like mayonnaise, like ketchup is a good example. Ketchup, the viscosity changes when the ketchup is flowing. It gets less viscous when the ketchup is flowing, which is why it's easier. Okay, so what right. type of fluid is ketchup? Well, how do they categorize ketchup? Like, what is that called? I mean, it, it's also called a non-Newtonian fluid, if that's what you're getting to. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. That's what I thought a non-Newtonian fluid was, ketchup. Well, um, it, it's one of them, but it, it's it's 
its viscosity goes in the other direction, right? It gets less viscous, right. yes, yes, whereas non the cornstarch and water gets very, very viscous for, right. for an instant. All right. Um, have they done like, you know, they're aggregated in all this, uh, you know, high speed photography and all that stuff, have they actually uh, taken a picture of a shock wave underwater? Uh, you know, uh, that would be a really good thing to do. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think what they'll see, if they get the right kind of camera, is they'll actually see a block, like I was describing, a block of ice literally appearing on the scene, and not a small one either. With the 50 caliber, it's going to be a, like a big block of ice, and then it's going to disappear the instant later. I, I That's what I think is going to happen. All right, so your model is to basically the compression, all the hydrogen bonds or some bonding thing, all the water molecules suddenly become interconnected through bonding due to the great pressure and it acts like this huge... Right, right. Because yeah. you see, the, the thing about hydrogen bonds is that H2O is naturally a, a polar molecule, but in the liquid phase, its polarity is turned off by itself. And what I mean by that is that when H2O molecules make hydrogen bonds with each other, they neutralize that. So what's happening here is the energy is knocking those hydrogen bonds out of place. All right. the, the water is no longer solving its polarity. Now it has real polarity. And it comes up and it just, just depends on how much energy is there. You can create a whole bunch of it, but it's only going to last for an instant. It's going to go away. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. They're so interested about shooting different types of stuff. I recommend the video made by the person named Saki San, he's Armenian, <coughs> and he's going to the Nevada desert shooting all kinds of stuff, including all types of waters. Another question? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Oh, another question. Like, so random, I just like surfing today. So I was just like, could you do it? Like, you have these wave poles now. They have these wave poles now, and it really hurts. Like, when you have a bigger wave, could you just have a giant wave pool with like, you inject it with like all these weird substances? So. It's like, it doesn't hurt as much. Oh. Is that like retarded? <laughs> no, I was like, I was no, like, because well, they have the wave holes. I was like, it could probably mess up. Because you put chlorine in that's, that's, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that was a real phenomenon, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah. That 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 release yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's, it stinks. Yeah. It, yeah, diving into the Newtonian liquid from 10 meters is right. not recommended by science. <laughs> Case of yes. All right, uh, Sid's coming up next is our last speaker of the evening. Just to let you guys know once it's done, hot dogs are ready, so you guys need the hot dogs. Uh, I think by the time we're done and we ask uh, 21 questions, we'll probably have cold hot dogs. Cold dogs? What would be cold dogs? Or hot dogs? <laughs> yeah, cold, cold exactly. Cold dogs or hot dogs? Oh, I'll go for one. Hot dogs? Hot dogs cold or cold dogs? dogs. <laughs> Newtonian dogs. Warm dogs. Warm dogs. We'll have warm dogs. Okay. <laughs> well, so I wish this subject attracted so much attention as the Newtonian, non-Newtonian shooting. <laughs> fish in a barrel, but that's just economics, very boring. So, uh, again, I'm Slet, I'm making that presentation time and time again. My company, Vernomics, we watch uh, macroeconomics and try to profit from it, uh, trading or selling, buying Bitcoin and managing digital capital for other people. So, what happened during the past week was very important because the first time in uh, how many in almost a year plus, several months, we got uh, so-called so personal consumption exchange price index, <laughs> which, is a, which is the indicator watched intensely by Federal Reserve, mostly core part of it, without food and the energy going down. This is super significant because uh, uh, that's the only part of the total inflation indicator which uh, Mr. Powell can really influence. He cannot, he cannot influence the price of oil, of price of energy, of price of other or price of food, but he can destroy economy, destroy the demand side, 
So basically the job is almost done. Still, we have Powell, which is chief of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee, saying they will continue to raise the rates. However, he is, uh, as a member of the committee, uh, the person who is responsible, who is, who is in charge of the um, Chicago Board of, uh, sorry, Chicago Fed, he's saying opposite thing. He's saying, why don't we kind of think now about the situation and probably we over tightening. That's market, that's why markets become super confused and everyone <laughs> basically sold. So we got a Thursday when market crashed in NASDAQ, probably you've seen it, and we touched almost 1300 by NASDAQ. Fortunately for us, John, uh, almost majority of people in crypto, they don't care. They just hold, hold it. And we didn't have anything like this. Uh, it was small down tick, but that's all up tick. Still, that's a positive development because we now know that uh, Federal Reserve can report to population of the United States that they've done what their mandate says. And it gives us hope that they will stop torturing us here. So negativity, we still have money, for, we still have all productivity indexes going down, not consistently, but some months up, but not another couple of months down, including uh, Dallas one, which basically reflects the, the manufacturing activity in the Texas region. Also today was published uh, was published the Chicago Manufacturing Index. It's also down. I see what you're doing, Jason. Uh, we, yeah, most of that is uh, mm, seasonal, right? Because uh, manuf because you don't do manufacturing like every day, right? So basically you do manufacturing, then it's down and it's up. But you see consistent trends here, here, and for example here. In, in, uh, that was mortgage crisis, 2007. That was uh, free, uh, you know, our prices, and then it was more or less stability. So now we got people in use crisis, basically by two people. One is uh, Mr. Powell, another one um, on another side of the Atlantic. I will name him, but everybody knows him. So uh, the other result, we do have more pronounced bearish picture in Nasdaq. My projection is some, somewhere here, but. Uh, it might might not come through, of course, uh, because uh, strange strange situation when majority of that price was driven by six companies. You probably know most tech, most driven by AI. Now this downturn might be driven by the much larger uh, amount of stocks, oh sorry, uh, spectrum of stocks, including from manufacturing to. Uh, Healthcare, everything. Although healthcare is, of course, it's non non cyclical, probably going to stay. But this might be more fundamental. This decline might be more fundamental than we expected. Bitcoin, <laughs> hooray! It hit <laughs> it hit my target here a year ago. I established the target as a positive for the positive trend, but it needs to make uh, to thirty three thousand. But it hit the target of twenty seven. Uh, the uh, September. What it means, I don't really know. Because my projection a year ago was that we either have a run to almost 35 and then downfall, or we have a uh, downfall to E. We kind of linger, not exactly in between, but it's slightly better than in between. So that's a picture. Uh, well, I wouldn't be uh, dwelling on this, it's kind of projection based on Elliot waves. In, any questions? Hopefully, yes. Thank right. you for your patronage. If, if you guys want, if you guys enjoy this stuff, you know, you guys just regularly, if you, if you guys want the macro and crypto updates, make sure you guys join the Discord. He's been updating basically weekly, Monday to Friday. So it takes you two seconds to join in. You guys can see what he's been posting, which gives you a recap of all that data, instead of you going to all these websites to see what it posts, two seconds, it's all there. Quick. Think they boom. All right, questions. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for doing this. So I understand the relationship between the PCI, right? Like PCI is basically stuff is getting expensive, right? You raise rates, lower demand, and hopefully that drives the prices down. But how what is the relationship between the manufacturing indexes? and the rates. 
Well, uh, yes, that's a very good question, especially because um, so manufacturing, or as we call it, business activity, meaning, for example, you invest and you produce, you invest in the machinery, you invest in equipment, you make something, uh, it will be uh, factory floors, that may or may not be affected directly by the grid. Depends on the macroeconomic situation. For example, in the 1990s or in 1995, sorry, what I'm saying, in uh, 2019, 2017, we got a period when rates went up and went up for, for about two percentage. It was absolutely no consequential for manufacturers because uh, manufacturers who they are, they are entrepreneurs, but well, okay, they are big scale entrepreneurs, they're not like us, small scale, right? So they think ahead, and I think they do not think ahead two, two years. They think ahead 10, 20 years, the building empires. For them to stop their activity just because there is a uh, difficult situation on the money market, it's, it's not a reason. Let me ask you about the opposite. Like, what does this mean for the rates? Like, does it have a... Mean oh, that. sorry, I misunderstood you. So you mean is there a backwardation, like backward like, connection between like, rate and manufacturing yeah, like and manufacturing is. and rate? Yes, there is, but that mostly on a political level, because uh, rate uh, Federal Reserve has a mandate for two things to watch: unemployment and inflation. That's it. Federal Reserve is not in charge of making us entrepreneurs more productive or more inventive or making big uh, corporate executive richer, no. However, on the political level, of course, and, uh, like corporate executive is good in saying, well, must got very like substantial influence, and they use that influence to impose that, of course, it's not, it's not a direct pressure, but any chairman in the history of the United States was always pressured by Senate and by uh, Republican, uh, by the Chamber of Representatives. That's how it works, through political loops. Right. So, so yes, basically, basically it's, hey, manufacturing indexes are down, so please don't raise rates. Exactly. So it's it more like uh, we are living in a beautiful country of United States America. Do we want to go down as compared to China, who is kind of investing in your manufacturing? However, the whole purpose of uh, the political structure of the United States to have a division of power, that's exactly why we have Federal Reserve independent from allegedly or from executive branch of a regulatory branch. They have private company, they're private, you know that, right? So it's supposed to be 12 banks making independent decisions about finance based on their kind of uh, and think of the current situation is uh, inflation. But uh, reality is much more complicated. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, go on. So I read today, I tracked gold in Bitcoin, and gold went down to 1850. Yes. Okay, this week. It's, it's in the toilet, right, for the year. And wow. and whenever that happens, I read what happened. Now, supposedly, core inflation went up annually to 3.7% increase, something like that, that was what was in the news. Yes, that's three, correct. 3.7% increase in core, yearly, yes. in yearly in core inflation, right? And that's what caused the market to flip out because they expect the Fed will now continue to raise interest rates because of this core inflation. It's not because of the consumer price index. Well, no, 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 that's not what happened. It's just opposite because we have inflation still there. But the rate of increase on in inflation is uh, slow, it's kind of less, you understand, right? It's going down. Inflation is still going up, but the rate is going up, slowing down. That's what makes markets more optimistic. That's why today we got a rally in Nasdaq, you can see, it, at, the, at, the, at, at the morning. Then everyone saw, sold because we got uh, like technical factors. But uh, price-wise, we got a positivity. However, recession size, we got a negativity. So it's kind of a very tricky situation because Federal Reserve saying we got a very strong economy, continuing employment, full employment in fact. That's why lowering the rate doesn't make sense because you don't have anyone to hire. So we better still keep the rate as high as we do on 4.5% because it makes more good than harm. That's basically, and us in the market saying, oh no, we don't want that. That's why we sell. 
It's kind of that logic. All right, last question. Yeah. Okay, so there's a big debate whether the Fed should continue raising rates or should just stop here. So let's have a vote. Uh, who thinks the Fed should continue <laughs> I like it. raising rates again? Raise gonna, your hand. They are going to raise it eventually. So, so, who, so, okay, who thinks they will raise it? Who want to raise the rate? No, I don't okay. want to, but I know. And who thinks they, they should raise the rate? Okay. Oh, that's a minority. Why not? Guys, who want the money? Who want the money? Just like raise the rate. That's uh, come on. They lower the rate. And then prices, right? Because it goes up. Who cares? Just bring the money. Give it to us. That's All right, everyone. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everyone for hanging out here and having those online talks. Uh, thank you, sir, for hosting. Oh, by the way, five dollars goes to what's your name? Hey, yeah. that was a quick question. I like it okay. about manufacturing. You got five dollars in crypto because it's a price for best question here. Yay! Cool. Yeah. Oh, with that said, uh, yeah, enjoy the cold dogs. I mean, hot dogs, warm dogs, whatever dogs they are. And you guys gonna be here next week? Um, here's a suggestion. Let's do a quick potluck. And then you guys plan on bringing some stuff next week. That'll be great. Like today, I brought a box of chips. Those things, those things were gone quick. Good thing I snacked the bag before. <laughs> Before they were gone, by the time I turned my back, they were all gone. It was crazy. So, anyways, with that said, everybody, the number one rule at Hacker Dojo is be excellent to each other. All right, everybody, have a good night.